Okay, all fragrance flankers are not cash grabs. The title was simply meant to get you to click, but this does not nullify the idea that many people do believe that fragrance flankers are cash grabs across the board. There are many directions we could take this topic, but let's first keep things simple with this question. What would make people believe that fragrance flankers are ploys to make more profit off of the back of what was already successful? People are feeling this way for a reason, so let's examine it. Well, I do believe that on the surface, the reason could be what I just said. Flankers are often seen as easy ways for a company to make more money off of the success that they had in a previous release. I don't believe that this in and of itself is a bad thing, but how it is done can be questionable. In my personal opinion, I do believe that a flanker should offer a new scent personality based on the identity or DNA of the original. This change in personality may or may not give the flanker a change in function, meaning that you can wear it in a different way or to different occasions than you could wear the original. Now, keep in mind that this definition that I gave you of what a flanker is, is rooted in the idea of being a fragrance enthusiast. The problem is a majority of brands, especially mainstream brands are seldom thinking about fragrance enthusiasts like you and I when they're creating a new fragrance. Their target is typically what you could call the fragrance casual. This person is not keeping track of new releases, thus they might simply see variety where there is actually redundancy. This manifests in the idea that most flankers we see from mainstream brands today are what we can call concentration flankers. This is where the new fragrance primarily differs from its predecessor in presence and behavior behavior more so than in scent itself, because the flanker is either more or less concentrated. It might use monikers like Eau de Parfum, Parfum, Elixir, and other variations or combinations on those terms. As we discussed, an array of concentration flankers can simply add variety for the average consumer. Multiple slight tweaks to a DNA across multiple flankers of that DNA allow for each tweak to appeal to different people and different tastes. However, with the right treatment, they they can result in a relatively new personality. Let's first look at the mainstream market. Dior has mastered this, in my opinion, with their releases like Om Parfum, Sauvage Elixir, and Fahrenheit Le Parfum, as well as others. But outside of the anomalies we just mentioned, concentration flankers are not inherently bad. There is historical significance to them, and some of them turn out to be quite good and even improve upon their predecessors, albeit just being slight tweaks. For example, in my opinion, Bleu de Chanel Parfum masterfully takes the original DNA of the EDT and makes it richer, classier, and more definitive. I do believe that it's important to note that unless you consider yourself a fragrance collector of some kind, the biggest misstep you can take with concentration flankers is by collecting them. I would treat concentration flankers in the same way that they are marketed to the fragrance casual by brands. Pick the one that works best for you because they can easily become redundant. Staying in the mainstream realm, let's take a look at the other main type of flanker, what I call the personality flanker. I know it's a dumb name, just go with it. These are ideally, as I described them earlier, offering a new personality built upon the original DNA and thus avoiding redundancy among their collections. Now, in my opinion, here are some examples of some mainstream personality flankers that did it right. Paco Rabanne, One Million Lucky, Azara Wanted by Night, Cartier Dec Declaration d'un soir. Most of the Guerlain L'Homme Ideal flankers. Cartier Pacha Noir Absolu. Versace Eros Flame. The Lalique Ancre Noir line. And many more. There are, of course, many, if not more, examples of personality flankers that didn't do it right, in my opinion. Most of the modern Armani Code line. Much of the modern Aqua de Jo line. Sorry, Armani. Many of the YSL Y flankers. A lot of the Jean Paul Gaultier Le Mans flankers. And too many others. The bottom line is that the flankers flankers in these collections are not bad, they're just frankly unnecessary. They were made to hardly set themselves apart from their predecessors, and thus not really offering anything new to the market. All this being said, I imagine that most of us by now expect flankers to dominate the mainstream market. It's what designer brands are doing these days, and there's really nothing to be upset about. Honestly, this is something I had to learn. I believe that most of the disdain for flankers that I'm seeing these days lies in the niche realm flankerizing, so to speak, as a marketing strategy has become more and more prevalent among niche perfume 
brands, which has left a sour taste in the mouths, well, a pungent odor in the nostrils. You gotta be kidding me. Of many consumers like you. It's obviously not an issue for everyone, but here is what I've observed about why it is an issue for many. Niche perfumery has for a long time been synonymous with artistry and uniqueness, unconcerned with trends and popularity. So to see more and more brands making it a regular practice these days can feel like stooping to some consumers. It is crossing the invisible separating line between mainstream and niche, effectively blurring it with one of the remaining divides being price point. I understand this concern. I know people want to feel like when they're buying niche, they are actually buying niche. They're paying that high price for something different, something special. And it's hard to feel that way about a flanker based on what the mainstream market has done to flankers. However, I don't believe it is inherently a bad thing, even for niche perfume brands to do flankers. Because just like in mainstream perfumery, I do believe it can be done very well. Here is a list of some well-known niche perfume releases over the past few years. And I will briefly comment on ones that I believe stand out as something special and ones that are possibly redundant. Mancera Intense Red Tobacco. I believe this is very redundant. The original was intense enough. Marc Antoine Barrois Ganymede Extrait. Some of you might be surprised to hear this, but I do believe it is redundant. I don't believe it improves upon the original. It actually kind of distorts the original a bit, unfortunately. The original is still superior for me. The Creed Aventus Flankers. I do believe that the Cologne Flanker is good. The Absolute is not redundant, but I think it's questionable. I would still choose the original over the Absolute at this point in time. Mancera Intense Cedrop Boise. I also I also do believe this is redundant. Having both is just unnecessary. They're too similar. Roger Parfum Elysium O Intense. I do believe this is a standout release. It does set itself apart as something quite different from the original Elysium DNA. Definitely built upon it, but with a new personality with that rhubarb note that gives it something totally new. It's actually a little bit more niche in a way than the original, but Apex Parfum, this is redundant. It came out six months after its predecessor and hardly does anything different to it other than making a little bit rounder, a little bit more refined and denser and maybe a touch more long lasting, but overall it's the same scent profile and way more expensive in a smaller bottle. So I still recommend the EDP, which is just fine. The Nishane X series. I'd say it's mostly redundant. I have liked what I've smelled thus far, but next to their originals, I don't think they're absolutely necessary. Many would say the original Originals are still superior. And finally, the Amouage Exceptional Extraits Collection. I believe this is mostly a standout collection. I don't see a ton of redundancy in what I've smelled thus far. I do see some differentiation. I am actually wearing the brand new Jubilation 40. Today as my scent of the day, this is my first full wearing and I've been enjoying it pretty much all day long. I've been smelling it around me for about eight hours now. It definitely has that Jubilation 25 character, that DNA. It's just richer. It's a little bit more bold. It's a little bit more elegant at the same time. That being said, I will say it separates itself more up close than it does in the air. In the air, it smells much more like the original, in which case it can be redundant. But if you want to enjoy it as an enthusiast, when you do smell it up close, you'll find it is quite different. And I do think it does fix some issues that a lot of people have with the current formulations of Jubilation 25. If you missed my unboxing and first impressions video of Jubilation 40 that I did with my wife, you can check it out here. Now, please keep in mind that I'm not saying that the redundant fragrances I just mentioned are bad. Many of them are very good. Mostly what I'm implying by saying redundant is that I don't believe it is a necessary release. You can choose whether you prefer the flanker or the original. And I think both are good, but I don't think you need both. Anyway, that's just a little bit of an examination of this issue. I just wanted to touch on it. And most importantly, I want to know what you think. So go ahead and let me know down in the comments. What are your thoughts on the current state of flankers, especially in niche perfumery. Do you think it's something that should exist at all? Do you think in balance or moderation it's okay? Or do you think, yeah, it should be free reign just like the mainstream brands, just give us more releases? Let me know and thank you so much for tuning in. Peace, I'll see you in the next one.